Parliament, which is streamed on Facebook, YouTube and LinkedIn. We'll be talking today about the recent testimony of the former Facebook employee, whistleblower Francis Haugen, yesterday here at the European Parliament, who blew the whistle a few months ago on uh, the company's uh, practices, what they choose to, how they choose to disclose the data and uh, on their impact and use of technology on communities around the world and more specifically here in the European Union. And to talk about this today, I'm joined by Christelle Schall de Mose, and uh, who is lead member of, for the Digital uh, Services Act, and Andreas Schwab, also member of the parliament and uh, responsible for the Digital Markets Act. Uh, both of you work on important pieces of legislation who, which uh, actually will have a profound impact on the future, uh, on the digital future of the EU. Before we start, I want to ask you to, of course, put in your questions and I'll try to ask as many as I can to my guests. So, Mrs. Schaldemose, I'll start with you. What was your impression from yesterday's testimony? And uh, did you leave the hearing with a, with a sense of urgency on that something needs to be done as soon as possible? First and foremost, I think it was relevant for us to, to have her in the parliament and to listen to uh, her experiences with uh, Facebook. We are, of course, making legislation that goes beyond Facebook. It's not just Facebook. But, but I think it was relevant also to, to learn uh, some of the business practices we have, uh, we have seen from Facebook. For me, it was interesting. It was uh, useless. Uh, not, it was useful. Uh, and, uh, and I took a lot of things away. Uh, most and f most, mostly, probably, the need to regulate, the need to do something to prevent the bad practices we have seen from Facebook. So I was uh, maybe not happy, but I was uh, satisfied with the hearing. And the uh, well, same question goes to you, Mr. Schwab. Um, this will have some sort of impact. But do you think this will impact also uh, moving forward to the way the parliament legislates, or do the legislators already know uh, uh, about these issues? No, I mean, there have been um, rumors, there have been uh, doubts, there have been ideas, but it was quite impressive how uh, this lady has been outlining all the different business practices that are there. I want to say it like, uh, like that very clearly, that are there just to make money. Um, and it, this is in a certain way the normal way of the economy. But if you see um, that this is the only logic of companies that have quite a lot of importance to modern societies, it's uh, scaring. Uh, and we can do something and we want to do something and we want to do the right thing and I think we got very good ideas yesterday but it's not the end um, of the story there will be new practices and therefore we have to make sure that the laws that we are voting now are future-proof, as we say, that they can also fix problems that come up in the future. Obviously, you both are working on important pieces of legislation proposed by the European Commission, uh, and the Parliament is a co-legislator on, on these uh, two um, acts. Uh, I want to, but before we get more into details on this, I want to ask you, Mrs. Schadelmose, you previously have mentioned that these revelations um, will have an impact on the, the Digital Services Act, and thus European users and Facebook specifically, but also other platforms in the near future. Are these provisions in the proposed Digital Services Act uh, enough to avoid abuses uh, online? No, uh, the proposal from the Commission doesn't, in my opinion, go far enough to solve the problems we heard from Francis Haugen. But uh, parliamentarians here from the Parliament, they have, and myself included, have tabled amendments in order to, to try to fix it a little bit, go a, bit, a little bit longer. Mm. The most important thing uh, here and now, on the basis of what she said, is, you know, the algorithms and the recommender systems from the platforms, they need to be, uh, they need to, they need to be, uh, made, uh, you know, a trend. we need to know what is going on, they need to be more transparent and the platforms need to be accountable for how they use uh, the algorithm. So I, I, I try to say it like this, you know, I don't want them to be liable, the platforms for what you and, and me and Andreas put on our Facebook uh, profile, of course, because it's our content, so they should not be liable. But the way they use our content, the way they recommend other users, the way they, they, they work with it, you know, using their algorithms, they of course need to be responsible and accountable for what they're doing. And here I don't think the proposal from the Commission goes uh, far enough. Here I think that Francis Haugen gave us a, good, a couple of good ideas on how to do it. And, and we need to make them accountable. So uh, if something goes wrong, for instance, she talks about mm -hmm. 
uh, young women uh, being exposed to uh, things on Instagram that makes them really uh, have problems with their mental health. Then, of course, I think uh, platforms should be liable. So if somebody hurts themselves on the basis of that, then, of course, they should be liable. So here, I think, or at least accountable, I think we need to, to do this. Uh, indeed, fascinating revelations yesterday on on how this uh, on how platforms choose actually to to operate with their algorithm. But it's like the wild west, and at the same time, it's their business model. So they act. They basically choose to. Um, amend and uh, adapt their business model ac according to, to the market. And basically, uh, that's how Facebook chooses to, to change algorithm. It is, to a certain extent, up to them to, to, to change the algorithms. Very often, even we complain on why does certain uh, but messaging... But of course, and, and that's the right of a business yeah. to decide. I'm but just playing the devil's no, no, but, advocate no, but, 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 uh, but that's true. Yeah. They, they have the right and that's the, their business. But if you take the pharmaceutical industry yes. or toys industry or whatever, they are also have a business and they produce uh, drugs and, and toys for, for, for people. But they still have a responsibility and they, need, they are liable for what they are doing. Yeah. So we have put in place for them legislation on how we allow their business to, to take place. Mm -hmm. And that is just what I want to do also for Facebook and other platforms. Make sure that they have a frame so that they know what they are allowed to do and what they are not allowed to do. And besides that, of course, they have to do their business. And an important uh, proposal for the Commission is the Digital Service, uh, Digital, uh, Service, uh, Digital Market. Markets Act. Uh, too much jargon. <laughs> Digital Markets Act, if you could simplify it for us, what does it mean? It also uh, includes rules on how uh, businesses operate on, in the market, correct? And how do these two uh, legislations intersect with one another? Well, I, I would say, but this I, I don't want to intrude in the area of my, my colleague from Denmark, but I think the Digital Services Act is most of all a procedural law to make sure that what is allowed and what is not allowed in the online marketplace is exchanged as quickly as possible in between member states and with the authorities responsible to fix it. Mm -hmm. The digital market set on the other side is a, a rather a, a law on market power. Um, so it's not uh, so much uh, coordinating in between the 27 member states of the European Union, but it's looking f most and foremost on the biggest companies and how they misuse uh, their market power to rule out competition or uh, to misuse dominance for their own business interests. And this is not allowed in the European Union, but so far we have not found the best tools to fix it. And with the Digital Markets Act, we want to improve these tools. We want to not anymore wait for the companies to do something which is forbidden and then run behind them. Mm -hmm. We want to tell the companies, listen, you have to do this. And if you don't, you cannot even continue your business. Mm -hmm. So we want to change the burden of proof, making the European Commission a much stronger regulator uh, in the area of competition policy, as they don't have to wait anymore for the wrongdoing, but they can fix it already ex ante, so on beforehand, as we say. And uh, I think uh, this answers somehow uh, to the question of Tommy, who is uh, following us live on Facebook, uh, who says, why is there only one Facebook, meaning only one of its kind platform? Why does one platform have monopoly uh, for this long? What happened to competition and having an alternative, he says. Uh, I'm sure others try to launch. Um, well, I think Probably. once there was a very good idea, let's say, with Google, with Facebook, and, and I think Krista can also come up with some insights what they do uh, to avoid competition. But they have had a very good idea, and then they have had a strategy to cover the market in all areas. And mm -hmm. where they have been seeing that the market is too strong and there is competition, they have just put money on it. Uh, like that, they have been covering, they have been buying small companies to destroy uh, competition. They have been investing into business models just to take down others. And there is this famous proposal that I've just learned today of Futu, an app that was giving some possibilities to create gifts. Mm -hmm. And in, they wanted to buy it. One of the gatekeepers wanted to buy this technology that you can make your own gifts. And the company said, no, we don't want to be bought. We want to stay independent. And what they did, they just copied the business model and have integrated into their yes. apps. And this is for sure a, a, a very bad behavior. It's forbidden, but it's a market power that is misused. And that we have to stop. 
Uh, but, but, yes. but, you know, DSA and DMA is interlinked because this is the market power we need to solve in the DMA. But still, we, the things we're trying to tackle in the DSA is... D is stands for Digital Services, Services Act. Act. <laughs> the platform legislation, you could say. Yes. Uh, is, is, we are in a situation that we cannot do what we really want to do in the legislation because uh, the arguments I meet, at least, is that if you regulate uh, Facebook too much, then uh, the businesses who use platforms, uh, uh, sorry, Facebook's uh, 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 ads, services, uh, services yeah. ads, they cannot work because they've become so dependent on, on Facebook so that they don't have other places to go and, and, and reach out to their customers. So in many ways, uh, I, I think that this also shows the problem we have today with some of the very large uh, platforms. They have become so big that they are too big to touch somehow. Uh, because if we touch them, that will affect companies using the platform's mm. services. And in my opinion, that is, that is a problem. We need to have a better competition. Uh, we need to have a more diverse uh, uh, market. So I hope that uh, Andreas will solve that in, in the DMA so we have a better market in the future. And more choices also for uh, businesses to, to, use, uh, to, to reach out to their uh, consumers and customers. A market that is comprised of 27 uh, EU countries, also very difficult to find common ground. A simple question, do we have a common definition on what constitutes hate speech in the EU? No, no. I mean, in, today we have, in many ways, we have 27 uh, different uh, ways of interpreting this. And that's also why we try to not go into harmful content, but only illegal content, because already here it's, it's different. And my favorite example is just to, to show that we have different ways of doing this, that in Andreas' uh, home country, Germany, it is illegal to deny that Holocaust took place. In my country, Denmark, it is legal. We don't like it but we wanted to come out in the open so we have a chance to say to people and prove this is not true, look, uh, that we have uh, uh, facts and, and things like that. But for good reasons, it's banned in, uh, in Germany. And in my country, it's, we, we don't have the same history. So that's an example that we have different traditions, different historical backgrounds, etc. And therefore, we also have different ways of defining what is illegal and what is not legal. And, and if we should broaden the scope and also say what is uh, harmful but maybe not illegal then we have even a bigger uh, difference so it is difficult and therefore we still have to keep uh, also a structure where you say that uh, the member states we cannot harmonize every kind of uh, aspect about what is illegal in EU at least not now I don't know what will happen in the future but at least not now so we have to respect the 27 different member states on, on this but at the same time have a horizontal, you know, have some common mm -hmm. uh, uh, obligations for, for the platforms to comply with. Uh, and you mentioned Germany uh, and uh, Frances Haugen yesterday, she mentioned Germany as one of the examples. For example, when Facebook allocates resources to the specific countries, they consider Germany as top priority, especially during the elections. And they managed to allocate the proper resources in order to mitigate uh, hate speech and especially disinformation during the election campaign. But in some countries, this is not the case because language support, it requires human resources, and then don't allocate this. It harms also other democracies, also in countries outside of the EU. So um, my question is, as the parliament uh, heads into the EU elections in 2024, and the tools to pollute this online discourse uh, with this information are more sophisticated than ever, um, do you think that these digital regulations will create uh, some, uh, with, uh, will provide some accountability uh, and responsibility towards the platforms? Or well, I think the, the, first, the first point of this example that you have been choosing from yesterday's hearing is that if we don't find the rules that apply, that are applied all over the place together, so in Denmark, in Germany and all over Europe, then it's up to the companies to choose what rules they will uh, use as a pattern. And that will always be unfair. 
uh, if they take the Danish model. We mm. would not like this in Germany because we, for our history, have said that it's forbidden to deny the Holocaust. Uh, if they take the German model, the, the Danish would not like it because they, for their freedom of speech principles, they say, no, everything what you can, can be so stupid that you can even not believe it, but you can say it. Yeah. So the, the choice that we have to make is somehow that it's a common European uh, value that we want to defend here, and we want to defend it all over the place. There are that little examples that we have been focusing on now that are different, but apart from that, all over the place, we want to have the same rules. And I think this is an important principle. And with that, we can also avoid that companies choose one or two markets where they invest a lot and the rest they forget. Like that, we can oblige them to invest all over Europe the same money to make sure that elections, that democracy and freedom of speech are respected all over Europe in the same manner. But it's true that we have problems today because if you have the bigger languages, Facebook have more people uh, and more resources put into those languages because bigger languages also mean bigger uh, markets. But for smaller languages, we, we have a lot of them in, in EU. We are, uh, you know, maybe uh, more, uh, you know, uh, exposed to, to, to bad decisions from Facebook. And let me give you an example. We have a famous Danish uh, journalist mm -hmm. on Instagram. And she, she reported from Kabul's airport in August with, uh, with the takeover of Taliban. And she reported about it, uh, but it was a kind of an anti-terror reporting. She was not uh, supporting them. She was scared, and she tried to report that. But uh, Instagram put down her uh, uh, content. content because probably she showed a picture uh, of Taliban uh, cheering and then you had the Taliban flag and that was uh, seen probably as terrorist uh, content but if they had real good uh, language solutions they would have been able to read that this was in fact anti-terror content supporting the fight against terror so uh, here it is important that we make sure with common obligations throughout Europe that uh, the platforms have to comply with a lot of obligations among others also to make sure that they have the same safety requirements in place no matter what kind of language you have. So we have a problem here and we need to do something about it uh, and hopefully that uh, uh, the bigger platforms will also uh, by the end of the day comply better if they have better tools and better more languages in place. But it is a problem. Well, if they can detect uh, certain languages, they can do it with other languages. And yesterday, was this was also the discussion. Um, in her statement, um, Facebook whistleblower uh, Ms. Haugen uh, said that the DSA, the Digital Services Act, has a potential to be a global golden standard. Uh, it has uh, to be strong, and its enforcement has to be firm. And end of quote. Are we on time to ensure that regulations, this goes to both of you, uh, brought into force will bring about about a global standard on the online world, such as uh, like uh, the GDPR one did, for instance? Well, I mean, we were uh, some years ago with the Internal Market Committee in, in Japan. Mm -hmm. And Japan, for example, has taken over the European legislation on cybersecurity. Uh, I was lucky to be the rapporteur on it, and on uh, general data protection. Why have they taken it over? Because the principles uh, of the democracies are more or less the same, and the rules that we are setting are becoming respected by the companies that deal with it. And then it's much easier if other company, uh, countries in the world take an, an uh, advantage of our legislation. But for this, our legislation has to be very, very good, to be very blunt, uh, and very practical. And I think somehow we are struggling with that. Um, on the Digital Markets Act, I think we can for sure make sure that competition is a basic value. And this basic value is more important than ever because only open economies allow open societies to exist. Mm -hmm. Only in economies where all people have the feeling that they can make their business work, where they can dare make their innovation uh, a reality, only in such societies democracy can grow and we have open societies. That's what we want to defend in Europe. And if we do it well, I think it can also spread uh, over Europe. And I think it's the same for the Digital Services Act, Crystal, no? Yeah, well, I, I do believe that uh, if we do it right, we will set the standards uh, globally. In, in many ways, rather simple. You know, if we put up obligations for platforms uh, with, uh, when they work in Europe, uh, targeting uh, European uh, users, then of course um, they would um, they would probably also you know copy paste it for their services uh, many other places in the world, uh, or uh, some countries will 
want to copy what we do so that they have the same kind of protection. And with the DSA, we're trying to make up a rule book for how platforms can work. And we want to give users, no matter whether you're a business or a consumer buying goods or, uh, you know, a, a, a citizen expressing mm -hmm. your point of view, you need to have some rights. And that is what we're trying to do. And I'm sure that other countries around the world will follow, uh, maybe not uh, as fast as, as we would prefer, but I'm sure that it will be some, it will set standards globally if we do it right and if we do it fast. Okay. Let's believe in goodwill, and I believe it personally, but uh, sometimes there are also controversial views, like that, the one from Eric, uh, from, uh, who says on Facebook that we should stop bashing companies, that we should help companies and not go against free market. Is this the case here? No, but we help companies, but we help all companies and not only one or two. And there is plenty of companies that are suffering from unfair behavior of a few. And our aim is to make sure that there is fairness in the market as much as we can assure it. Um, and so we help companies. We haven't spoken about those companies that we are helping. Mm -hmm. We have only spoken about others. But Eric can be relaxed. We want to defend business practices in the European Union to continue to operate. We exactly want to defend the companies that have to use the platforms and we want to have a better uh, level playing field so that they are still in business. So we are really defending them. I am defending them and Andreas are defending them. Uh, I, Mrs. Kalimos, do you think the, DS, the Digital Services Act will make tech companies disclose the way they choose to extract personal data? So, for example, it was mentioned yesterday by the Ms. Haugen that uh, the way companies choose to is the way they interpret, choose to interpret it. But, for example, they are not asked how they extract the data, for instance. Do you think, I know it's very specific and maybe it's too detailed for now, but do you think we should go to this direction and make companies disclose all of the way they extract data and they share, uh, and obviously share, um, like make, create an obligation for them to share this data with, uh, with uh, authorities? Yes, definitely authorities, uh, definitely authorities. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I mean, if we, if we have a legislation uh, in place, uh, we need to be able to see whether they are complying with it on, or not. So they need to reveal this for at least the authorities, maybe all to researchers uh, uh, and, uh, and maybe even the public to a certain extent, mm -hmm. uh, maybe not s business secrets, but still I think that they need to, to show more of what they're doing, uh, but, uh, but we are working on it and let's see where we end. It's still a little bit too early to say whether we will be successful on this because we still have to finalize our position in the mm -hmm. parliament and after that we have to negotiate with the council, uh, so we don't know what the final outcome will be. But Stay assured that we uh, rest assured that we will do whatever I will do, uh, whatever it takes to make sure that we have a well functioning uh, legislation in place. Um, Mr. Schwab, you mentioned previously uh, in a previous statement uh, that digital, the Digital Markets Act will make sure that personal data can only be used for political advertising if users give their renewed consent and that we can never have a Cambridge Analytica 2.0, very bold by the way, <laughs> for where personal data is uh, abused for political gain. How do we make, uh, how do we ensure that this does not happen again? And what sort of oversight does this legislation ensure? And to what extent do you think it will companies be made to disclose the data they, they um, possess? Well, I mean, first of all, what we cannot do in one or two laws is to fix all the problems. So therefore, on the political advertisement and all the risks around that, we wait for the European Commission to come up with a proposal in November, so at the mm. end of this month, um, where they want to come up with specific solutions on this. And I think it's important because our elections have to be neutral. Political uh, parties have to have their own messages, not being misled by platforms. And more importantly, p positive and balanced messages should not be neglected and only radical and extremist positions coming out. And this is a huge problem that we are at the moment faced with in political uh, discussions. If you are just saying, I want to have a world where people understand each other, no one will care about that tweet. If you say, uh, we have to fight uh, that we kill all the others, then the, 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 the tweet or the message will be seen. That is not a good world in, we are, in which we are living on at the moment. And that is something that we have to address. And we hope that the Commission come up, comes up with proposals on this. What um, concerns the question on how to make sure that 
and the information that the, especially the big platforms are having. Mm -hmm. uh, we have heard yesterday uh, that, for example, 80% of misleading information on COVID has been coming to 4%, 4 of the users. So the problem is that you have a certain number of people, only a small portion, but they get all the misleading information. And for sure, they are, uh, it's too much for them to check all that. So we have to make sure that what is good scientific practice is somehow shared all over the place, and that all parts of the population and all users get a bit of information about the normal life, so that you don't end up in a bubble. That is very delicate because it has to do with freedom of speech and Chris is discussing about that every day. This is very complicated because freedom of speech means also that you can decide yourself to listen only to stupid stuff. But if a platform is pushing you there, that would be the wrong choice. If you choose yourself, no one can stop you. And we've, we've heard recently uh, that uh, some Facebook staffs tried, you know, to, to, to see how fast you uh, ended up in these rabbit holes, you know, where you only received uh, recommendations for, uh, you know, conspiracy uh, theory uh, pages, etc. And it lasted three days, uh, and then they were in this rabbit hole. Uh, and this is clearly Facebook's responsibility to make sure that you don't end up in these kind of rabbit holes with, uh, you know, no way to, to come out of it again uh, and with no balanced, uh, you know, uh, information. So they, the platforms, will have to take a responsibility to make sure that they are, uh, you know, um, using their algorithms and recommender systems in a way that don't uh, uh, ruin our democracy and that gives people uh, balanced information. Uh, and, and, I, and I think that they have to do more than they're doing today. And hopefully our pieces of legislation will be a little step in that direction and more will come later on from the Commission. And then hopefully some uh, uh, common sense also will, will uh, come into Facebook uh, sooner or later. Uh, you know, they, I think they are afraid of their business uh, and I think that they are looking into how to, to do things better. Maybe they should start looking into how their algorithms works. What Francis Haugen told us was, they are doing this because they earn money. They want us to stay on the platform as long as possible. And in order to make sure that happens, they have to recommend us things where we get engaged, involved. Yeah. And very often that is bad things, you know, because then we become angry. Controversial, uh, yeah, you uh, cont controversial things. Then we are uh, working because then they know, then we click and, 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 and spread the news. Um, so they have to do more, and, and we need to uh, push, uh, put a pressure on them to do more to avoid this. M meaningful interaction, say, says Facebook. Uh, yeah. Do you think that's the case also when it comes to political content? You, as politicians, are present on social media. You've seen certainly your, uh, your content going down because Facebook is putting more uh, uh, resources to and, uh, and more focus to, to meaningful content uh, between uh, people and friends uh, and groups. Uh, but that has, is, is basically taking people into these so-called uh, um, eco chambers. So do you think that uh, this sort of... Um, this first, uh, this legislation being brought forward, also this testimony yesterday uh, here at the parliament will help uh, raise alarm? Well, it helps to understand better some elements that we may have not heard that bluntly before. Um, so, for example, the point that I was just making before was something that I haven't heard ever before. I think it was also impressive that it was very professional, the presentation of all the elements. Um, but we have to understand that in the United States there is a very strong, let's say, economic battle of, of shareholder value companies uh, that want to gain more money. Uh, this is not forbidden, but mm. it's up to the lawmaker to set the frame in which this is possible. And I think in Europe we have really to come up with uh, stronger and more clear rules to make sure that we are not in, in such areas where that freedom of speech is important, where the political parties play a role, where, where we are speaking about the common good, mm -hmm. that this is misused for money-making uh, uh, practices. Uh, we have to discuss bluntly, but the best argument has to win and not the worst case that makes most, most money. Any timeline before we end this interview on the Digital Markets Act? Well, I, I hope that we can vote in the plenary in December mm -hmm. um, and then we will see with the French presidency how we can come to an agreement. Um, and I'm very hopeful that we can not only do it on the Digital Markets Act, but also with you, no? 
Will we have a digital single uh, digital services act before the European elections in 2022? I certainly hope so, but I don't dare promising anything. Good. I hope so. I hope so. We all want uh, um, a healthy conversation on social media, although we cannot uh, eliminate completely hate speech uh, and disinformation. Uh, thank you very much for being here, and uh, I hope to have you again to discuss about this as soon as possible. Uh, thanks to everyone who followed this uh, live. We'll be back with uh, more lives. If you want to follow yesterday's testimony of uh, Facebook uh, whistleblower Francis Haugen, you can go down our feed on Facebook. And thank you to everyone who followed also from LinkedIn and YouTube. Have a nice afternoon.